thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to present today on the concurrent resurgence of RSV and other respiratory viruses that we all have experienced over December and January of this last winter. These are my disclosures. I have several sources of COVID and respiratory virus research funding. Uh, these include funding from the NIH and NIID, as well as NICHD, and from the DC Department of Health, as well as a Pfizer vaccine trial. None of these are relevant to the uh, lecture at hand with regard to conflict of interest. So I think we all have been very focused on COVID circulation in the United States over the last three years. And here I'm showing a very nice COVID tracker that New York Times puts out each and every day um, showing the entire trajectory of the uh, pandemic. And as, as we all have experienced, we've had several different waves, the most remarkable of which was in January of last year in 2022, when the Omicron uh, variant surged. And thankfully, since that time, we've had this lower level of circulation of COVID with some slight increases even uh, recently, but nowhere near that massive surge when the first type of Omicron variant surged. What also we all experienced was during this entire time over the last three years, there was really no co-circulation of other respiratory viruses and particularly not in the pattern that we're used to seeing, um, meaning those that we know come in the fall, those that come in the spring. And in fact, it was so marked that at the beginning of the pandemic, many of us scratched our heads and wondered if there was actually a biologic basis for this, meaning interference of receptors or some reason uh, why a patient infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus could not perhaps not be co-infected with another virus. And now what we've seen as we have loosened up all of our uh, social distancing, our really uh, marked use of masks in all settings, is that there has been an explosion of re-emergence of these respiratory viruses. So that really has uh, answered our question about is it really uh, possible to be co-infected with multiple viruses? And we know from this winter that the answer to that is a resounding yes. So this was a CDC health alert that came out in November of 2022, when it was already appreciated that there was really a marked increase in multiple viruses and co-circulation of particularly respiratory syncytial virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the beginnings of circulation of influenza virus. Um, and this was really in marked distinction to everything we had seen in the earlier parts of the pandemic. So um, this is slides showing uh, the influenza activity uh, in the United States, comparing this season, which is 2022 and 23 in the red triangles with other prior five prior seasons. And what you can see in this slide is that the US influenza activity was higher and earlier than in all of these prior five seasons. So here we are in weeks 40 through 50 of the year with this large spike of influenza, which is eclipsing any of these prior years and of course many weeks prior to what we usually see. Additionally, it wasn't just the amount of virus, it was the severity. So US influenza hospitalizations were higher and again occurring earlier because of the circulation of the virus than in those other five seasons. So red again is this 2022-23 season compared to all these other prior seasons. What about respiratory syncytial virus? Again, uh, infections and hospitalizations markedly higher than in the prior five seasons. So if, even if we look at this for pediatrics, which is in the blue, or if, uh, the youngest kids that are zero to four years of age that are at highest risk of hospitalization, um, we see that this huge spike of hospitalizations in these younger kids vastly surpasses that what we saw in the earlier seasons in 2019, 20, and 21, and even 2022. So what are the possible reasons for this large surge in co-circulation of these other respiratory viruses that suddenly came out of, the, out of the woodwork in December of 2022? One thought is that the lack of circulation in 2020 and this very small, oddly timed, small peak of RSV in the summer viruses really correlated with when we decided we were going to ease measures to prevent SARS, the measures that we knew uh, decreased SARS-CoV-2 transmission. We had vastly less social distancing and less masking. People were going back to school, back to normal conferences, in-person meetings. And with that, we really saw 
the, the fact that these measures not only were preventing SARS-CoV-2 circulation, but all these other viruses. And then that was made even more um, marked because of the so-called immunity gap. So because in the last two years, there really has been no opportunity for young children in particular to have any exposure or develop any immunity to these viruses. When they now had emerged, it was causing a large number of infections in children under uh, four years of age, and particularly those under two years of age. And in fact, even the older children who had in previous years had some exposures had waning levels of immunity that had not had an opportunity for natural boosting because there was no circulation of these viruses in the environment. And in fact, even older children and family members who were more likely to get infected could then pass this on to these immunonaive uh, children. So in summary, during the initial two years of the COVID pandemic with stricter social distancing measures, we essentially had no other viruses co-circulating with SARS-CoV-2 virus. And since we've had a return to more normal social interactions and fewer mandates for masking, we've seen this large resurgence of multiple co-circulating viruses in addition to ongoing circulation of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we continue to monitor this and in the last few weeks, um, we continue to see the total number of patients testing positive for these viruses continuing to decline. So we're very relieved that we're past the very large uh, winter trifecta, as we call it, with those three viruses that really surged. Uh, all of these viruses continue to decrease, although we're keeping a very close eye on RSV, as well as the newer variants of Omicron as they emerge. Now for physicians and clinicians that are seeing these patients, it's almost impossible to distinguish these uh, with a single patient in front of you. And as you can see in this very nice summary that was uh, prepared by the CDC and the graphic from CNN, um, if you compare the symptoms that patients have with RSV, COVID-19 and influenza, you see a lot of overlap of the red dots. All of them can have congestion, runny nose, cough, uh, they can also um, have sore throat, but some of the, the viruses are more likely to call we cause wheezing, and in particular, respiratory syncytial virus is much more likely to call cause wheezing than either COVID or flu in children. Um, and in fact, muscle or body aches or uh, loss of taste or smell are much more common to occur in COVID-19 than in RSV. Now, this is a nice graphic, but in reality, when the patient's in front of you, it's almost impossible to determine which they have without specific testing. And at our center, we do utilize testing, particularly in high-risk patients for which an, an intervention would be utilized if we could identify a particular virus. So these are specific considerations for healthcare providers from the Centers for Disease Control. We of course recommend and offer vac vaccinations against both influenza and SARS-CoV-2 virus for all eligible people. And that is now people that are six months of age or older. So almost all children are eligible and able to get these vaccines and we need to encourage this. We, uh, incur the CDC and we encourage diagnostic testing in the appropriate patients to guide treatment and clinical management. And we treat patients with suspected or confirmed influenza who meet clinical criteria uh, with influenza antivirals. And that still remains oral oseltamivir, five-day courses for all ages, as well as a new option of relatively new option of oral veloxivir, uh, which is called Zofluza as a single dose. The uh, oseltamivir is approved for all ages. Uh, in outpatients with severe complicated or progressive illness, hospitalized influenza patients, and even those that have uncomplicated disease if it's very early in the illness. Uh, Baloxavir, on the other hand, is for patients who are over 12 years of age with high risk of developing flu or related complications or acute uncomplicated flu in otherwise healthy patients who are five to 12 years of age. We also have other choices such as inhaled zanamivir and IV paramivir, but these are used much less frequently. And then finally, we wanna treat outpatients and hospitalized patients with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection who are identified in high-risk categories for progression to severe illness, but we are limited to Paxlovid, which is only in those over 12 years of age or over 40 kilograms. And, and the same is true for remdesivir, uh, uh, so we will often bring these patients in for a three-day outpatient infusion if they are younger or smaller and cannot uh, get uh, uh, oral Paxilvid. 
So the crystal ball, you know, what is next? Are these viruses going to con continue to circulate and surge? Are, we, are they going to now come down to a low level and stay low for a while now that the population has been boosted? We really don't know the answer to that. We need to continue to be very vigilant and watch uh, both test positivity and hospitalizations for these viruses. As you all know, we, we also are not sure what's gonna happen with the Omicron variants. We see in the news all the time, uh, little reminders that there have been slight increases in hospitalizations and cases, but there are over 600 variants of Omicron and none of the variants that have emerged so far are, are really uh, a different um, heritage from Omicron in general. So we haven't seen this progression from something as different as Delta or Alpha to Omicron. The current one that I'm sure you've been following in the news um, is the XBB.1.5. Uh, and this graphic from the Centers for Disease Control illustrates that as of January 21st of this year, this particular variant is now uh, up to 50% of all the variants in the United States and even higher in some parts of uh, the northeastern part of the United States. And this uh, bars on the right just show you the evolution of all the other variants that emerge and then decrease such as BA.5 to almost negligence now, whereas a new, a new variant may emerge at any time and then expand uh, as we're seeing in the purple bar with XBB 1.5. So we'll have to continue to stay tuned and see what happens with both SARS-CoV-2 as well as these other viruses. So in summary, I'd like to acknowledge all of the Children's National Hospital teams for emerging infectious diseases response. This includes our special pathogens isolation unit and response teams, our infectious disease and infectious control divisions. And I'd like to particularly call out the infection control division that makes all of the, uh, does all the data surveillance and graphics for our weekly viral surveillance. We have other uh, very specialized task force for whatever um, emerging infectious diseases emerges. So we have congenital Zika program, acute flaccid myelitis, as well as MISC, which affects children. And I'll end there and we'll take questions during the panel. Thank you again.